he was a, a recent uh, graduate student of Shoucheng, and he will talk about the, um, I think, the atom to vac algorithm about the AI and the physics. Yeah, today is a long time for the <laughs> for leaving Stanford University, so <laughs> it doesn't welcome me too much. <laughs> okay, let me get started. So I'm Chen. I studied physics in Stanford University and graduated last year. So Shou Chen is my advisor over these years, who mentored me and guided me over these years. So firstly, let me thank. It's okay? Yeah. Okay, it should be much better. Okay, so to be here, let me first thank Barbara and Shoshan's family, Steve, Xiaoliang, and all organizers of this workshop for giving me this valuable opportunity to be here today. And it is such a great honor to me and Alice for a long time. Maybe even including today, I feel like I, feel like I don't deserve it because I don't have the confidence in the world to say that my work during my day PhD life makes Shou Chen satisfied, or not even to say proud. So that's why I hesitated for a while when I received the re invitation from Xiaoliang. So forgive me for my late response at that time, because I spent a lot of time reflecting over the years of with Shou Chen and trying to seek for the courage to be here today, until I realized that if I miss today, maybe I will miss Shou Chen. So I will miss Shou Chen's lessons, meaningless again, and let him down again. So let's get started. Of course, being bold is not the only lesson Shou Chen keeps teaching me over these years. He, as the great scientist, thinker, and pioneer, always influenced me from various perspectives. So before the talk, I would like to share with you some of the most important points I have learned from Shou Chen. So firstly, of course, always keeps your curiosity and the open mind. So for those people who are familiar with Zhou Shang, I'm sure nobody would not be impressed by his open mind and China curiosity. So he has so many wide interests and strong passions for so many fields beyond physics, say information theory, history, neuroscience, even recent artificial intelligence and blockchain technology. So he never restricts himself to this scope, to a narrow scope, and I feel that that's why, maybe that's the source of his creativity and originality. Another point is that always ask big questions. For me, as, as his students, what we feel the most at that time was Shou Chen's big questions, very high level questions raised in our discussions. These kind of questions are insightful, but very hard, very sharp and tough. 
so they force us to rethink what we were doing in this research, and of course, save us from being lost in the details. And in this kind of process, we learn how to develop our own research test and also learn from children how to ask, the, ask this kind of quest, questions. And the core, I think, believe this kind of big children's big question and insight is his deep belief in the simplicity, simplicity fundamentality, and uh, even the beauty. So I think the logic, the, the philosophy, social philosophy is like always stick to the first principle, even though the world is so complicated. And uh, facing the completed world, another point I want to mention is that maybe just being bold, even though the road you take is less traveled. And this is all more or less a paraphrase of the piece of poem from Shou Chen. Why do you feel the abysses and peaks in the long journey? So after this kind of sharing, let me get into my talk today. So the title of my talk is Learning Items to Discover New Materials. This is basically our exploration work with Shou Chen to see to a new field to see how we can leverage the AI techniques to do something in science, or put it more concretely, how we can leverage some AI algorithm to understand items and use this kind of knowledge to uh, assist the material discoveries. So I'll try to organize this kind of talk according to, to the, according to the bullet point I shared with you in the last slide, such that I hope that this can be give you an example to show the spirits of children from my perspective. So let me get started. Of course, we all know over the last two decades, we have witnessed the huge success of machine learning and AI. Based on the development of the fancy hardware, the big data, and the fancy algorithm, say the, big, the deep neural networks. So for now, day, the computers can understand this kind of image, encode the information via the convolution neural network, and decode them through the recurrent neural network and then speak out or describe what is happening in this kind of image. Even more, computers learn how to play Go against humans based on learning the policy function and value function through the self-play based on the Monte Carlo tree search. There are also a lot of applications of the machine learning and AI algorithms in physics. Say, since the deep neural network is a universal approximator, Researchers are using this kind of thing as their variational wave function for simulation of the strong correlated systems. And more typically, people are just using the neural networks as they classify, as the, as the classifier to classify the different phases of matters. But when we explore the new area, the new area of AI and uh, machine learning, the, qu the big question Shou Chen asks to us is more like a philosophical thinking. So as we all know, these are standard or famous criteria to test the intelligence degree of a, of a machine, and that's the Turing test. Basically, it says that if a machine can do what human doings can do, then it's almost the same with humans. So it is artificial intelligence. For example, if we believe that human's language or the conversational behavior is a human's high intelligent behavior, then we humans should not, can, should, should, cannot, should not be able to distinguish the natural language conversations between a human and a strong artificial intelligence. But the question I should propose here is like, can we push this kind of step, this test, one step further? Let's say we don't only consider the high intelligent behavior, we consider some more strict behavior, say the high intelligent behaviors with original insight. And the ambitious question here is that, can the machines do science by themselves? It's a pretty ambitious question, and with no doubt, the most challenging one to answer this question, to, towards answer this question is how we concretize it. Fortunately, in human history, there, was, there have been so many intertwined between humans' intelligent behaviors. I will give a one example here, and that's between the language and science. So the example is like, we know, we all know that Mendeleev event discovered the periodic table of category elements in the 19th century. 
this a fact we all know, but people may not know is that at that time, Mendeleev also, also said that he, his invention or discovery was inspired by some alphabets, or, or by some alphabet of the Sanskrit language, which is a very ancient Indian language. So that's why when back at that time, um, Mendeleev gives the gives Sanskrit names to the missing elements when he found when he found it in the missing position of his table. That's why gallium discovered by Mendeleev is named as Akha alumina. And Akha is actually the name of the, 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 the meaning of one in Sanskrit. So somehow in this kind of thing, we can see there's a, at least some deep connect, connection, although it's vague, between the language of science. This kind of inspir inspiration actually make us promote, promote a more concrete version of these questions here. Since AI today can do so well in the human language, can we borrow the same kind of thing to do something like the atomic discovery? Say, can, we discover, can, we, can AI discover the periodic table of the chemical elements here? So before I answer this question, let me give you some background of the AI techniques well developed for on language today. So in this kind of language, there are basically two pillars of works. Firstly, machine trying to understand words while a huge number of text sources. They can be different sources and different fictions or human languages. And uh, machine just use this kind of statistical information to learn a vector representations for this word. And this vector representation usually capture the semantic, the semantic meanings and the similarities in this vector space. And another pillar is that machine also cons con construct some compositional models to build some high level uh, meanings based on the input of the word in this kind of language. Say in a sentence, we can have a lot of language tokens. Then we can use the position or composition model to build some high level meaning of the sentence and even do the translation afterwards. And after this kind of behind the two pillars of work here, there are actually two fundamental principles. The first one is definitely the distribution hypothesis. This is the one behind how machines do the understanding or learning of the words. It states that maybe similar words tend to appear in similar contexts. So for example, look at this kind of two sentences. Let's have to learn materials from data and let's study materials from the data. You see that material, we, can, we can safely say that learn and study is kind of similar because the, the, context, the language context of these two words are exactly the same. They are letters, materials, and the data. So that's one thing. Another principle I would say is the compositional, compositionality principle. It, it says that sentence meaning is determined by the words and the composition rules. Since we already have the understanding or the vector representations of the words, and uh, we also know that neural network is a universal approximation function. So we can use that way to build the composition function to fit this kind of compositional rules. Another thing you might already know is that, you might already notice that when we go to this kind of principle level, the similarity between language and atoms or material science is, is even clear. Say, on the language side, we see there's a word that that's the building block of the language. And uh, we can have the dependent structure in the language itself. And for material size, we know the atom is just the building block of the materials. And so word is almost equivalent to the, ad, uh, to the atom in the material size side. And the dependency of the sentences is almost the same with the bond structure in crystals and the molecules. So once we have this kind of analogy, then we can formulate this problem like this. So what we are going to do is like this. We hope to learn some representation or vector representation or what we call embedding vectors for atoms from the existing materials data. And that is the, on the upper one, we call the learning atoms or the atom to vec algorithm. And once we have a better, better understanding for the AI of the atom itself, then we can build some compositional models to extract some high level information, the material, side, material level information, and use some supervised machine techniques to predict the properties of these materials. 
and in this talk, I'll mainly focus on the upper, uh, the upper on side, which is the learning items or the item to vac algorithm. And if time allowed, I'll also show you some examples how we use this uh, item representations to build machine learning models to, for the materials pr prediction. So the data of what we use for to do the atom size, atom understanding or learning comes from this uh, database. It's called the material project. Basically in, the, in this database, there are about 100,000 existing compound logging in this kind of database. And uh, of course, before we use this kind of data to, to design algorithm to learn the atom's property, we do some data analysis and cleaning here. For example, we found that more than 80% of this um, compound are binary, ternary, and quaternary. So for simplicity, we are only focused on this part. And also we check the distribution, population distribution of the chemical symbols in the database. Say, and uh, as you can see in the uh, right chart, there's a sharp kink in the distribution there, I mean, which distinguishes the common chemical symbols and the real chemical symbols. And for this work, I will, I will only consider the common part. That's what is about roughly 100 chemical symbols or the atoms we'll consider. And as we, are, we have already mentioned that we are borrow similar strategies as the AI for languages. So the core idea is the distribution hypothesis here. And uh, in materials or in, for the atom size, uh, one thing we can do really true is that the distribution of environments actually represents the atoms' properties. But how we do that? We have several ways to do. Here I will show you the first way, which we call the model-free methods. In this model-free method, we directly start from the, ad from the pairs of the atoms of the and the environments the atom lives in. For example, uh, let's take the example of the bismuth selenite. In this example, we can pick a target atom from the materials, maybe the bismuth. Then we can hard encode it, the environments the bismuth atom lives in as the two similar three. Well, two is the number of, of the target atoms in the context, and similar three is all the other atoms appears in the materials. Once we do this kind of exp um, process, then we can analyze all pairs, or atom environment pairs in the materials database. Take a simple example like this, we, can, we do the process for each materials and record all the information in this kind of atom environment table, matrix. So basically, every entry, uh, every, uh, entry of the matrix stands for the number of instances of the atom environment pairs appearing in the database. So clearly, from this kind of matrix, you can already tell something, very naively tell something, the property or the similarity of atoms. Say, bismuth and uh, selenite are kind of similar because they can appear in the same environments as two, tetra three. But this kind of information is far from complete. One thing you should notice that it heavily depends on the data. It heavily depends on the data. For example, if there's in the materials data, there's no such a thing connect the oxygen and sulfide. Then it is impossible to say oxygen, oxygen and sulfide are similar. So to go one step further, what we propose is that maybe we should learn this kind of similarity for atoms and the environment collaboratively. And the one straightforward way to do, th and this, only through this way we can learn the high correlations between the atoms of the environment. Say the atom, well, atom A appears in atom B, or environment B, atom C, environment in, uh, atom C lives in environment D. But if we know B and D environments are the same, are similar, we can further infer that A and C atoms are kind of similar here. And one straightforward way to do this kind of collaborative filtering or learning is that we can directly apply the singular value decomposition to the atom environment matrix. And this is what we do here. And on the right part, I will sh I'll just show you the atom vectors we learned for this main group atoms and the hierarchical cluster results in the vector space. And as you can clearly see, we can, our algorithm can successfully distinguish different clusters of these main group elements. So we can see there's an oxygen group and there's even some calcium group. 
And they almost they, they resemble the clustering or the al alignment in, of these elements in the periodic table. Uh, its color means the stands for the uh, the columns of this kind of atoms in the periodic table. The same column means the same column. But we can also see that it's not that far. F it's, it's still far from perfect. For example, it is it's, it's very hard to distinguish the middle part of the periodic table. Let's say the carbon. But for this kind of thing, it's kind of reasonable because. For this, for the central part, they can have different behaviors, association behaviors, uh, in that region. To further see some properties of these kind of atom vectors, we project this kind of high-dimensional vector representations to its some of the low dimensional, say the principal component. So here I'll show you the first, uh, the, the first four component projection of the main group elements, the atom vectors. As you can clearly see here, some of the top principal com components already stand for some meanings or properties of the atoms. Say, principal component one can separate of the alkaline metals from the others. And the second, the second one pick out the alkaline earth metals. And uh, even interestingly, we observe that for the th third principal component, if you, see, if you see in that way, that direction is almost the same with the valence chain of the metals here. Like these start from the valence one, two, and three. So that's the result of the first method, or first type of methods we use for learning the atoms. That's the model-free methods. We also try some other methods, which is called model-based method. The basic idea here is that maybe we should not directly hard code the environments. We should also learn some representations for the environment as well. And the basic idea is that we can design some composition functions, which map this kind of environment to the same vector space of the atoms. And then in this kind of embedding space or the vector space, we can design a lot of functions called school functions, which compare the association strains of these atoms and the environment. And finally, we can go through all the data in the database and minimize the loss functions we define here. It's basically the cross entropy of the of the of the all the data set and this kind of cross entropy is defined by the association strings the log of the association strings here is basically what it's basically do is just the strings the probability of the positive examples in the data set so we have tried several ways to design the composition functions and the school function here for example, on the right hand side, this is based on, based on the very naive composition function here. Although it's very naive, it's very simple, but it will really show something, especially a very clear alignment of the chemical elements, which is almost the same with the periodic table. But unfortunately, when we go to the high level or the, or the last principal component, we found that maybe just some uh, kind of mess there. So the difficulty of learning this kind of atom representations using the model-based way is that it's very hard to design a correct or intuitive composition function and score function here. But along this direction, there are some works, there are some ongoing works along that direction. I will not go into the much details about this kind of thing, but just showing some examples. Firstly, for the environment representation construction, we can actually include more information like the distance information or structure information here and uh, in, encode this kind of information in a, tensor, in a high order tensors and use this kind of tensor to, to build some neural networks to learn the environment vector representation. Another way is that the compound or the materials basically we can simplify, simplify it as a graph structure. So the vertices of this graph is just some items. In this way uh, we can actually uh, use some, some, some popular graph co convolution methods to average the labeling atoms of the target atom and, build the, uh, and the, to build the environment representation there. These are basically different methods and directions along this strategy, which, is co which is aims to construct a better model based uh, functions and learn better atom, atom representations. 
Finally, I will show you something about the applications using our atom reactor representations. So this is just some uh, application to show you the effectiveness or the correctness of the atom vector representations we learned from this kind of data set. The first application is that we will test the, well, using these kind of atom vectors as inputs of some neural network model to test the performance of the formation energy prediction of the aposinite apos, apos, compound. It's basically some memory um, compound here. So we have like um, 10,000 aposinite examples in the training and the eval set. And we, too, we train this kind of neural network models and uh, see the final performance. And the result is that the prediction error is, can, be, can be as low as, like, as, low as, one point on, as 0 0.15 electron per atom. And this kind of accuracy is almost on par with the traditional dens density functional computations, but with much more computational efficiency. And the final result is that we also apply this kind of atom vector representation to build uh, machine learning models to predict some properties of the half crystal materials, say the formation energy and even the matter insulator classification. And we compare this kind of classification results against to the famous 18 electron rules. And using this kind of atom vectors, it can achieve almost the same uh, prediction classification accuracies there. Finally, I think I will stop my talk here and I would like to close the talk with some, some of the Shoshan's manuscript, manuscript on the artific artificial intelligence. This is actually the one I found in the shared Dropbox uh, with Shoshan. And the this is a Chinese version of the manuscript. In the, basically in this manuscript, uh, Shoshan discuss a lot of things, topics, and they try to combine this kind of topics together in a bigger or broader context. For example, they can, they they give his thoughts on the physics, life, DNA, information science, and even the recent artificial intelligence and the effect of this kind of thing in human civilization. And the title of this kind of administrative, as I translate here, is called The Era of AI. So for me, I, I kind of cannot imagine that there could be such a comprehensive dissertation about so many topics and starting from some simple beliefs and merged with some very solid reasoning. And what impressed me the most is actually Shouchen's extraordinary high optimism on AI. And honestly, for me, I'm a very pessimistic guy, as we already know. But in, when I see this kind of note, I kind of like to, would like to trust what they have say about the uh, what have they have say in this kind of dissertation? So even though I'm, I cannot resist any skeptical view towards new things or crazy ideas, I think I will choose to trust Shouchen because I believe that with so many talented and passionate pioneers like Shouchen in this direction, the era of AI maybe it will not be lot that far away in the future. Thanks. Questions. So uh, can you use your model to find some empirical relation between the properties of the materials like the uh, band gap and uh, the conductivity? Uh, yes, this is basically the application part. So here we only test this effective of the atom vectors in some simple task, that's the formation energy prediction and even the band gap prediction. But of course, if you want, we can also apply this kind of methods to predict the conductivity and even superconductivity. But one bottleneck here is that maybe for this kind of properties, we don't have so many data. And what the AI kind of stuff here is based on the data. And we load this kind of property, and then we train the model to fit our properties. Other questions? This is actually off, a little off, off, uh, off kilter, but uh, since you're on stage and you have to answer, uh -huh. <laughs> I, I thought I'd throw this out. So suppose um, you do this and uh, get lots of smart people and make, make uh, 
intelligent machines that can do really neat things, like predict if you're going to die of cancer or uh, uh, predict the stock market. Now, um, who owns them? That's my question. In other words, have you, have you got any ideas about the e economics, the economical re economics relationship between the machines and us? So I think I can only ask you a question just using these slides, because your question is more like a philosophical question. No, <laughs> it's an economic question, but, but I, I don't. Yeah, but I don't, ha I don't have a good answer to that. But maybe in one day, in the, one day in the future, there just in, exists some kind of thing there, but I don't know. <laughs> Okay, and maybe it's also very philosophical, but uh, very often when we use machine learning, right, for solving a physics problem, uh -huh. it's kind of like a black box. It gives us an answer, but we have no idea why it is. Yeah. So, and like throughout this workshop, one theme was common, okay, Shu Chang emphasized clarity, uh -huh. right, and like, so there should be an argument. So, did you guys discuss, or like, do you have an insight? So what's what do we gain if we get a black box answer? Yeah, it's kind of black box, but I want to say here is that behind the black box, there's some intuitions or there are some fundamental principles here. Because we don't learn this kind of thing totally aimless. We know what we want. For example, we know there's some, at least some first principle here. And we then build this kind of black box based on the kind of princ first principles. So in that sense, of course, in the middle part, there's some unclear things. But in this beginning part, there's something to support us. But I have to confess that even in today's AI or machine learning stuff, buzzy, uh, buzzless, there's almost no clear understanding. So there's a long way for us to do to really understand what the machines do and what, is the, what the AI artificial intelligence is, really is and why is it that. Uh, last question. It's not a question, but uh, address to Bob's problem, uh, Bob, Bob's question, because uh, if you look at a video, a uh, YouTube video on a Google talk of Shouchen, actually the same audience asked the same questions with the same way as Bob did, like who owns this? And uh, you know, Google people all believe that, you know, those big companies like Google will own it. And, uh, and Shouchen said, like, uh, because the that topic is like a blockchain, AI, and the quantum computer com computing, and so I believe that they should be uh, be belong to similar technology as, as like such as blockchain to be decentralized. And Google said, Google people said like, of course Google will. <laughs> 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 and, uh, and 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 so and so Chen said something like that. It's better to uh, to uh, adapt to the to the future then refused to it. <laughs> That's okay, since AI can have the infinite power, can you make it more complicated, like uh, design drugs? Design what? Drugs, drugs. medicine to cure drugs. cancers. That's actually a very promising direction. I think Barbara already mentioned it to me a lot about this. And when we did this kind of, we finished this kind of work, what Shoujin asked us to do, push this kind of methods to drug discovery. And that's what we call atom 2.0. But unfortunately, I do not proceed along that direction anymore. So I hope one day there's some things, there's some kind or some pioneers can work on that direction. And I hope that can, that can be achieved. Okay. Um, so let's, let's um, thank Shen again and leave more discussions to the breaks. Yeah, thanks. And thanks for the speakers.